So there you go, you can see that it's been published today, March 1st. There's the date down in that corner. So let's start by jumping into the forward. So there's a bit of history about how Linux from, from scratch came about. Um, the audience who the book's intended for. So I'm not going to go through all this in detail. It's something you can read offline. Uh, it's worth mentioning at this point, I always recommend if you've never done Linux from scratch before, um, read the book, either download and print it or you know, read it online. Um, just get an idea of how the book's laid out initially and then maybe if you can read it again just to get down into a bit more detail about the sort of things that you're going to be doing, what's involved um, in building Linux from scratch. Um, if you do that, when you actually come to do the commands, you'll be in a much better position, you'll be more confident about what you're doing at the terminal rather than having some surprises come up as you turn the page something that was unexpected that you didn't account for maybe um, so certainly read read the book through at least once obviously when you get to the packages you might just want to skip through them quickly just to see like what gets done a lot of the commands are quite similar some are even the same as uh, you know between certain packages but certainly these parts here where there's a bit of text to read I'd read them soak in the information it might be stuff you already know uh, it might be common sense perhaps but it's worth reading anyway because it puts everything into context um, as far as how Linux from scratch is built. So the target architectures for Linux from scratch, uh, it's mainly for 32-bit and 64-bit Intel stroke AMD CPUs. Um, you can build for ARM CPUs. I've built Linux from scratch for Raspberry Pi once. Um, might be something I'll do again actually. Uh, now that the the latest ones are all 64-bit, um, but yeah, so the book's mainly keyed for a 64-bit build, but there are uh, box outs where um, alternative uh, instructions are given for 32-bit uh, CPUs, Intel CPUs. Uh, there are also some of the commands uh, have got scripts built into them where they can detect whether the CPU is a 64-bit or 32-bit and act accordingly. So it might say if you're on a 32-bit CPU, you've got to run this code and you'll run it and it'll do its stuff. But there's a bit of code in there where you could run it on a 64-bit and it will detect that and it will just ignore it. Um, so it doesn't really matter whether you run it or not. Uh, because it's it's been made intelligent enough to do the right thing on the right architecture. So what I recommend you do, even if it says like if you're on a 32-bit, run this, or if you're not on a 32-bit, don't run this, I recommend run it anyway and let the machine decide what to do. Um, and you know, it, at least then you'll know that the right command has been uh, applied if you're a little bit unsure as to whether you should be running it or not, if it doesn't quite make sense. So prerequisites, um, as it says, it's not a simple task. You probably would need a little bit of knowledge about Unix administration, but if you've never done it before, if you follow exactly what I do, um, I can assure you that you'll end up with a working system. Um, Linux from scratch used to be a little bit flaky in that if you didn't quite follow it exactly, you could get down to, not well, flaky is the wrong word, um, Maybe not robust is probably a better word. It, it, you know, if you didn't do something quite right, it would break and you get in all sorts of trouble. They've they've written the instructions in such a way now that, um, you know, it's it's a lot more robust and you've got a much better chance of building a system successfully. For example, in what I just mentioned about the, some of the scripts where you have to decide whether it's the 32-bit or 64-bit CPU, they've built that intelligence in there, so it's it's less chance of you making a mistake which is why i recommend to put those scripts in even if you are sure you don't need to to run them in um so yes yeah, it's, it's a lot uh, more robust uh, the procedure now but there's despite there's some information here about um building software and so on and installing from source it's worth getting this background knowledge to give you more um uh, knowledge for building Linux from scratch in case you do come across a problem uh, you might be able to get yourself out of it 
Uh, Linux from scratch adheres to certain standards. These standards here it tries to adhere to. It might deviate slightly, like slightly for one reason or another. Um, I can't remember if any of these contradict each other, but it might prefer one over the other. Um, or it might do something a bit different just to get something working or because a certain packet, package needs it done a certain way. So it might not be absolutely 100% uh, adhering to these, but it does a very good job of adhering to these standards if it doesn't adhere to them fully. And it shows you why certain requirements are needed by certain packages. Um, then it gives reasons for why packages are in the book. Sometimes you might think, oh, what's that doing there? There's no point of that, or I don't like that package. I, I don't normally use it. Well, this gives reasons, rationales for each of these packages being in here. And I've, I've always got this feeling, but I've never been quite sure that the number of packages has been increasing over the years. And that's through no fault of Linux from scratch. It's because certain packages maybe have been broken down into more modular format um, or reliant on other tools to, to be built. For example, uh, Python never used to be part of uh, Linux from scratch. It wasn't needed. And now I believe GCC and several other packages need it to exist. Um, Perl was the main scripting language. If it wasn't the uh, bash shell, it was Perl. And now Python is used a lot for scripting stuff. So... Um, and another thing, Z standard XZ never used to exist as compression utilities, so that's two two extra packages that need to be installed to to um, allow extraction of source code, for example. Topography page that's important to take note of to get used to how things are laid out on the page. So, for example, these are commands that we copy and paste. It's saying here that sometimes a command so long it's split over two lines and you'll see that because of this backslash which tells Bash that this line carries on on the next line. So they've used that in the in the book to make the um, reading of the command easier rather than just have it wrapping around. It'd be hard to see where the line ends and so on. So you can always detect a command hasn't finished because of that backslash. Um, This shows the screen output, so it's not in bold, but it's still in the box. There's note box outs here where it gives you some information. Um, there's other information here about, uh, I think it's called a here doc for these sorts of um, multi lines. So you've got to put this all in. Although this is one actually one command, it's just split over several lines and it looks different because of the type of command it is. Um, and there's other information there about italicized text and so on. Structure of the book. So it's split into several parts. The introduction, which is a bit we're in at the moment, I think, or we're going to be in. At the, oh, no, we're in the preface. So, sorry, still. So I'll be in, in, in the introduction where we um, start to get to know the LFS installation a bit more. Then we go into part two, where we're preparing for the build. Part three is all about building the, well, a cross tool chain because it's built in a, a cross compiler method, even though we're not cross compiling technically because we're on the same architecture. Uh, it is a type of cross compiling the way that it's done, the mechanisms that are used. And then we build some temporary tools. And the stuff that we build in this chapter allows us to build the final um, proper LFS system, which is the bulk of part four and then part five is a load of appendices about the packages the um, scripts that are installed and so on uh, I think there's a glossary and so on lots of extra information so the Arthur and security advisories I've already touched on that in previous videos on the web page we've seen that and there's some links there to take you to those locations again directly from the book so we move straight into the introduction How to build an LFS system, so it digs down a bit more into the individual chapters now rather than just the sections of the book and it explains how um, each individual chapter achieves something in particular. So for example chapter 5 we'll get the initial tool chain 
uh, compiled using the cross compilation techniques. Uh, chapter six, uh, we use the cross compiler we've just built to build some basic utilities. Chapter seven, we enter a true environment, which is just like a special environment uh, where we build some more tools actually in the environment. So rather than in the host system, we're in this true environment. And then chapter eight is where we'll do the bulk of the work. And then chapter nine, 10, 11, finishing off doing configuration, configuring the kernel um, and getting the system to be able to boot. So what's changed since the last release? So as you can see, most of what this is about, it's only a point release. It's only gone from 12.0 to 12.1. So most of it is just updates to packages. Some patch, new patches have been added and some have been removed. So it might be because the um, packages have been updated and those patches that have fixes have been incorporated into the newer version. So they're not needed anymore. Uh, change log shows what actual fixes and changes have been done to the book itself so that could be quite interesting so for example one of those patch patches has been updated to include a security fix another one there for glibc as well resources okay so there's a fact here at the Linux from Scratch website, it's worth reading. There's mailing lists if you want to be part of, you have to subscribe to them to be part of them. If you want to get help or, or talk to the editors or people involved in Linux from Scratch. Um, there's an internet relay chat. Uh, can't say I've ever used that, but I imagine that could be quite useful if somebody's hanging around there waiting for uh, somebody to visit and help. And there's a number of worldwide mirrors to download the packages Uh, help, as it says, if uh, stuff in resources doesn't help, there's the general fact. Uh, some there's a hint there for errors you might encounter, and you can search ma mailing list with this link here. Um, I can also give help on my channel. Uh, I'm not always around on the channel to answer queries at all, so it might be some time, could be weeks before. Um, I'm able to give a reply, but I'll certainly help where I can. Um, possibly better off either searching the internet, doing um, a search for your problem, or maybe asking through these um, support channels that are mentioned here. Uh, but the important thing is, um, when you're asking for help is to give as much information at all and all of these points here in this bullet list are really important um i still get some people saying oh, i've got this error error one failure on gcc and that that doesn't mean anything you need to know what happened prior to that where it you know what um pack uh, what um actual source file it failed at and what the error was that was ejected from that error one is just a generic um error that means a certain thing happens, but it's not specific enough to be able to help anybody. Um, so if you can give as, as much information as possible, it certainly makes life easier. If you, if you help the person you're asking, um, you're actually helping yourself because you're more likely to get an answer and you're more likely to get an accurate answer as well that will actually help you. Um, as it says there, deviating from the book does not mean it will not help you, but you've got to be honest about the fact that you've done something different. Don't be afraid to say that maybe you've used, you know, the C flags, you've changed some C flags or something. Uh, be honest about that and you're more likely to get an answer. It might not be the answer you want to hear, like don't use C flags, but at least you'll get an answer and you'll know where you stand then. Um, compilation. Yeah, this gives you some information here about how you should present the error. And as it says here, most people just put that and that's just like, it doesn't set, tell you anything. All this information here is what, what would be really useful because you can see where it's actually failed. So that's the actual error there. Undefined reference. So it's occurred in this file here and you can see straight away it's part of make 3.7.1, uh, 3.79.1. Um, this is just the, like the trace back, if you like, of where the original call came from. So it's, it's not much use. 
but all of that would be very useful for anybody that uh, you're seeking help from. Um, and yeah, this link here is quite good. It gives you some information about how to ask a question in the right way.